So, dear colleagues, good morning and welcome to my stream. Today we will finish the first part of our seminar, the thematization of the Homer and uh, Homer spiritual spirituality. And next week we will proceed with the next, as it were, a father of the West, namely the uh, Vir Virgil, and uh, we will analyze his uh, his famous equoke. But first, uh, 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 let's turn our attention to the uh, topic of the last seminar, to the problem of Chaos Thanatos. So, uh, I have uh, prepared some question and uh, the first one is following. Explain Achilles' dilemma concerning his dual life paths, as stated in Iliad Book 9. How did Achilles solve this dilemma? At birth, Achilles was offered two ways, two fates that were mutually exclusive, either to achieve the hero's eternal glory at the cost of a short life, or to live a long life, but without any fame or glory. Achilles has never been made any explicit and conscientious decision about them. However, through his whole life, he realizes the first possibility. He leads his life as if already had all posthumous glory that will belong to him in the future. So, the next question. Explain the reasons of Achilles' wrath in the Iliad in the relation to the concept of Geras. Portion. Geras means an exceptional privilege, through which the social status of a person is recognized. It used to be an extraordinary share in spoils of war. Ordinary wars received their roughly equal share of the loot, but only the elite receive their corresponding geras at addition. Therefore, the Achilles Geras is the young daughter uh, of Brussels, and uh, the Geras of the High King Agamemnon is the young daughter of Chrysis. However, Agamemnon is forced to return his Geras to her father. He is deprived of his Geras and his social status is threatened. For that reason, he stripped Achilles of his Geras. However, Achilles did not cope with that because he is deeply convicted. The Geras and corresponding honor can be achieved only on the battlefield and are not a matter of high birth. So the reason uh, of the Achilles rat is a conflict between different conception how how one can achieve his honor. So the third question why did Achilles reject Agamemnon's gift <laughs> or <laughs> better say bribe of reconciliation in the ninth book of Iliad? Explain in the context of the conception of heroic honor. Achilles refuses, for if he had accepted, he would have lowered himself to the level of his rival. That is, he would accept the logic that it is possible to buy Tima, to buy honor, that is, that the honor is connected with an abundance of wealth or nobleness or social status given by birth. But, as we have already said, Achilles considers that ta, that, that, time, that, that honor can be obtained exclusively in a battle, where one risks not only his property, but his, but his own life. What type of immortality can be found in Homeric epics? There is only one type of immortality for Homer, to become Aoidimos, to become worthy of being sunk about, namely about 
one's great deed. The man can be immortal only achieving eternal glory, Kleos Aftheon in Greek. So, uh, the next question. Explain the concept of so-called beautiful death in Greek, Kaos Thanatos, that is the key of the last seminar. Kaos Thanatos, beautiful death, means to fall in battle in the burst, in Akme, of life or in youth. By the means of beautiful death, a man seemed to once and for all prove his virtue, his arete in Greek, which otherwise he has to repeatedly prove in battle. Beautiful death definitely reveals that the person is a good or true man. Aneragathos. So, what is the extreme opposite of the beautiful death in Iliad? The extreme opposite of Chaos Thanatos is simply leaving the dead body in the sun. That is, leaving the body to the free play of the forces of decay. Such a body will be rotten, eaten by worms and insects, decomposed into cows and nothingness. Oh, the, the death to fall in battle is not enough for the beautiful death. Yeah, the beautiful death means also the proper funeral. Yeah? And the negation of proper, proper funeral is to leave the body in the sun, leaving it to the forces, the free play of forces of nature, free play of forces of decay. So, next one. Explain the homeric concept of the flower or bloom of youth. In Greek, Hebes anthos, flower of youth. It means a special kind of heroic youth. And this kind of youth is a correlate of the beautiful death. Hebe, Homeric youth, is, as it were, a kind of charisma that is given to a hero regardless of his, of his actual age by his heroic death. A hero not only loses his life, but always loses his life in the flower of youth. Youth seems to, to belong, as it were, to the heroes in a stronger or in, in the strong sense. So, what about the aged heroes? <laughs> now, <laughs> what is the real? What is the role of the aged heroes, as for example Nestor in Iliad? Aged hero is a hero uh, uh, with first sign of grey hairs, huh? and such heroes are regarded slightly inferior in Iliad. They are endowed with eloquence and foresight needed for planning, yeah, planning of, of war action. Aged heroes also balance the sharpness and impulsiveness of the youngsters with their wisdom, but their role is slightly inferior. Yeah? They are not a true warrior in, or a warrior in the full sense of, of the meaning of, of this word. Yeah? Explain the bizarre habit of, mutilate, of mutilating of the dead bodies in Greek Ikea as presented in Iliad. Mutilation means, mutilation of bodies, of dead bodies, means depriving the dead body of all signs of youth and beauty. Through which the heroic glory of a fallen warrior shines. The main reason seems to be to deny the fallen warrior the eternal memory and eternal glory in the eyes of those who come in future. Why were the bodies of the true heroes, 
for example, as Hector, never actually mutilated in Iliad. So, the true heroes are darlings of the gods, and the gods grant them their beautiful death, as well as take care of their dead bodies, so that such heroes, as well as God themselves, can be honored in the songs for all generation to come. So, and the last question, explain the relationship between Greek sacrificial offering and Homeric and, and Homeric burial. The Homeric cremation, no, the, me, the Homeric funeral means cremation. Yeah? The Homeric cremation is essentially an inverted sacrificial offering, while during the Greek sacrificial offering the meat of the sacri sacrificed animals is intended for human ritual feasts. The bones are burned with fat on, on the altar as part of as part of belonging to the immortal gods who consume <coughs> bones and fat in the form of smoke. On the contrary, at the funeral, the human flesh soak it in fat is banned and the bones are buried are buried yeah. so it is all uh, 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 and now we can turn uh, to the last topic of our uh, homeric homeric mm, homeric uh, uh, analysis uh, and namely uh, that is death and initiation and yeah? I will uh, try to elucidate you the 11th book of Odyssey the book uh, called Nekia so the 11th book of Odyssey is traditionally called Nekia according to the ritual that summoned the shadows or souls of death from the underworld. Nekea contains only one story taught in great details. Odysseus descend to the underworld in the 13th year of his journey to his home, to the island of Ithaca. The Nekea is not the only place in Odyssey where so-called catabases descend to the underworld is described. In the last book of, of Odyssey, the descent of the slain suitors to Hades is described. However, this part of the epos was very probably composed later, much more later. So, the 11th book is genuine, Homeric book. Uh, so, this book divides the Odyssey almost precisely in half holding its narrative into two parts. The first part, the first part describes the hero's adventures from leaving Troy until landing at Phaeacians. The second part deals with Odysseus' return to his native island Ithaca. In the logic of Homer composition, Nekea is apparently uh, Neca is apparently decisive turn, decisive tropos of the whole epos. By the way, Odysseus himself is introduced as Polytropos, yeah? the man of many turns in the first verse of Odyssey. It makes good sense since encountering with that is the most difficult test for any hero. Defeating that, however, does not mean becoming immortal. You know, immortality in the strict sense is reserved only for the gods in Homer. But rather, symbolically dying and being reborn. In this sense, death means a transformation or initiation and this is how I suppose the 11th book of Odyssey uh, is to be understood. During 
his initiation. Odysseus lands what it means to be a mortal, that death is inevitable and grim, and the posthumous existence is shadowy, deficient and worthless kind of life. This experience changes his understanding of himself and his relationship to life. Nekia, 11th book of Odyssey, completes the story of self-knowledge presented in the first half of the epic and empowers the Odysseus, empowers Odysseus to set properly himself in all his social roles as described in the second half of Epos, as a father, as a son, as a husband, and primarily as a, as a, as the rightful ruler of Island Itaca. Yeah? So, the 11th book is a very good example of Homeric ring composition. So, here, on this slide, you can see the ring composition of Nekia. Uh, you can see here the book is uh, the first part of the 11th book is is description of the road to the entrance to, ha to Hades and the uh, Odysseus sacrifice. And uh, it corresponds to the uh, last part to the end of the 11th book where the way back is described and the correspondence can be met also in the in the core of 11th book. Uh, the main emphasis is however placed on the central intermezzo where Odysseus story is interrupted and we return to the Phaeacians palace. It is the only interruption of entire apology of, of entire of entire Odysseus narration of his adventures. Apparently, Odysseus follows here the way of traditional rhapsodes, which have interrupted their production at the most exciting moments in order to win the attention and eagerness of their audience and also claim additional bonus for bonus for their performance. Odysseus wants nothing but departure for his native Ithaca. However, his departure is postponed until the next morning. Desire to return is over overwhelmed by the power of, a, of um, an epic song that is casting its spell not only on the listeners, not only to the Phaeacians, but also on the rhapsode himself, to the Odysseus himself, who can't just stop his song halfway and just leave. Hmm? Further, partial emphasis is placed on symmetrical conversations with the trio of souls here and here. So, Odysseus conver conversation with his mother, Antiquia, corresponds to the conversation with our little big misogynous Agamemnon, yeah, here. Both conversation are dealing with the marital fidelity, whose archetype is Odysseus wife, Penelope. Or, on the other hand, female perfidity, or female perfidy, whose archetype is Agamemnon's wife, Coitimnestra. Yeah. So, the next uh, uh, correspondence uh, is uh, uh, between Odysseus' conversation with his, uh, his uh, 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 sailor, or uh, Odysseus' very open war. Uh, uh, and uh, this conversation corresponds to Odysseus' silent meeting with the uh, Greek hero Ajax. The accidental and 
uncause it, death of both of them, the death of Elpenor and, and as well as Ajax, is obviously emphasized here. However, the central parallel is conducted between Tiresias prophecy and the hero's conversation or Odysseus conversation with Achilles, which these two conversation complement and interpret each other. This represents the core of my interpretation and, in my opinion, the core of the entire Odyssey. I will return to it at the end of my seminar. So, let me introduce now a brief digression or digression in which I recall what destiny awaits humans after death in a Homeric world. It is common knowledge that Homer does not know the concept of body and soul as established in a later tradition. In the later tradition, he speaks of the soul of psyche only when soul leaves the body. That is at the, at the same moment of death, and un on unconscious or coma. After death, the soul leaves the body. As if exiled, so it usually leaves body through mouth and flies away. Its movement is very fast. The soul is compared to a smoke drifting in a violent wind when flying to Hades. Or in early iconography, the shadows of death also have wings. You can see one of the first description of human soul with wings here yeah that is attic jar from uh, uh five century uh, before christ yeah you can see here the god Her hermes yeah? hermes can be ident identified by his staff yeah you can see here a hermic staff that is a jar yeah? And you can see here a soul and winged soul which is escaping from this this jar, and that is one of the first description of the of the first first idea of the soul as winged uh, creatures or, or, or winged winged things. Yeah? So uh, soul or shadows fight straight to Hades and do not need any guide, any psychopompos. Char characters as uh, Charon, or Charon or Hermes, Chthonius, the guides, both are guides to the Hades, guides of soul to the Hades, and um, they are probably late. Hermes as a guide of, of the souls appears in the last book of Odyssey, yes, but uh, we have already said that the last book of Odyssey was probably composed later. Homer does not reveal any details of, of the journey of the souls to the Hades. Yeah? In the world of women, there, there uh, is a decaying body left. It is only mindless matter and if it does not get cremated it will be rotten and decomposed. The process of disintegration of the body is paid no interest in home. It is causing at most utter disguise. As long as man is alive he forms unity. That causes dissolution of this unity. The unity is divided to that corpse on the one hand and to even soul on the other hand. Therefore, until the funeral, the center of the deceased, his self, consists of two parts, the corpse and the soul. Both can be identified, identified with the self. 
dependent on the, on the point of view. Bereo means the cessation or cancellation of such dualism. At the Bureo, the body is symbolically given to the other world. It is first burned in fire and what is left is uh, deposited in the earth. After the funeral, the self of the deceased remains, remains identified only with the shadows or, or soul in the Hades. The shadow in Hades seem to continue in his life. However, in weakened and, as it were, worthless form, because he is deprived of all higher mental function. However, it's, it does not, it does not lose its resemblance to the original human being and is therefore called image in Greek eidolon or shadow in Greek skia. With regard to the precise status of the weakened, of such weakened existence, the relevant book is relatively unclear. On the one hand, it is evident that most of the soul attracted by the blood of Odysseus sacrifice are, as it were, totally vials and spiritus until they drink the blood of the offering, including Odysseus' mother Antiquia. However, on the other hand, Achilles, shadow of Achilles, does not seem to have to have had a drink before conversation with Odysseus, and Ajax is able to recognize Odysseus, although within having a drink. However, it is explicitly stated by by Kirk that the only shadows whose mental abilities his friends reminded intact in the Hades, uh, that is the uh, that is the friends, the mental abilities of the seer Tiresias. On the contrary, Tiresias does not give Odysseus any uh, 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 any conversation, any uh, uh, prof uh, prophecies uh, until he drank. So, how many cosmography sets Hades under the ground? It is said the shadows of the dead fly away, however, the direction or direction of the movement is rather downward. Theoretically, it could be possible to reach the Hades alive by a boat. It would be necessary to sail west, cross the river Oceanus, the river encircling the earth, and some, somehow to get to the edge of the earth disk at subsequently below it. Odysseus set out for Hades on the basis of Kirk's counsel, hmm? sorcerer Kirk's, living from her island, from Kirk's island, which is located in the Far East. His sailors must navigate north through Oceanus. There is apparently some discrepancy Rather, they should sail west, where Calypso's island, Ogigia, it is called also the, uh, the navel of the Oceanus, is found. Some scholars believe that Odysseus uh, has circled Oceanus all around in this adventure but had to say. Furthermore, it is quite unclear whether Odysseus actually crossed the Oceanus uh, and actually arrives on its other shore, or merely sail along his edge until he encounters an island 
where the entrance to the underworld is located. The way through is, is, uh, is more probably, yeah? it's more likely in my opinion. In any case, the Sumerian nations lives on the island with entrance to the underworld. There are even a city of Sumerians and an agora in uh, its center on this island. Whatever, it is rather a city of ghosts and death. The underworld darkness is constantly flowing there from Hades, which is character characterized as dark and smoky or hazy. The sun never shines there on the island of Cimmerians. Uh, another question is whether Odysseus actually enters Hades himself. According to the text of Eleven the Book, he seems to remain rather at doorstep of Hades, where, according to Kirk's instructions, Odysseus performs, is performing a necromantic sacrifice to attract the shadows of the dead. And Odysseus' conversation with them, as described it in the 11th book, takes place precisely there, on the doorstep of Hades. Yeah. In epic poetry, Hades is separated from the world of, uh, of living by a river that cannot be crossed by shadows of death until they receive a proper funeral. In Iliad, the river is usually anonymous, and it is called just Potamos, it is a general term for river in Greek. In the Eighth Book of Iliad, this river is called Styx. Huh? It's called Styx. In the Tenth Book of Odyssey, the following underworld rivers are mentioned Oceanus. Periphlegaton, Cocytus, Styx, and the last, Acheron. Acheron seems to be a boundary between the world of living and a sort of no man's land, such kind of transitory, transitory zone located before Hades. Why is Homer, Homer mentioned the river as, as a boundary? Of Hades and not, for example, the abyss or the wall of fire. For example, the underworld, the reason uh, seems to be following. The underworld and death in general are portrayed by Homer in a relatively undramat undramatic way, although they are, of course, unpleasant and ugly. Nevertheless, the death is necessary, and in such sense, it is nothing but trivial things, and on which there is no need to be particularly pathetic. The second reason for choosing the river as a boundary of Hades may be that the river is difficult to cross, and therefore the one-way character of the path to Hades is stressed such a way. So, let's turn uh, to the central central part of, of book 11, the uh, conversation with Achilles and prophecy of Tiresias. The reason, the main reason for Odysseus' visit to Hades is to consult Sir Tiresias on his return, of Odysseus' return. As for the journey itself, Tiresias gives Odysseus no advices, respectively nothing more what, Kirk's, what Kirk would have already told him. Instead of, of it, Teresias' prophecy relates much more to Odysseus' wither fate, which he awaits him when he finally returns home to his native island of Ithaca. So, the Teresias' prophecy is following. Once you have killed the suitors in your house with your sharp sword, by cunning or in public. Then take up a well-made oar 
and go until you reach a people who know nothing of the sea, who don't put salt on any food they eat, and have no knowledge uh, of ships painted red or well-made oars that serve those ships as wings. I will tell you a sure sign you won't forget. When someone else runs into you and say, and says, you've got a shovel used for winnowing on your broad shoulders, then fix that fine ore in the ground and offer rich sacrifice toward Poseidon, Vivaram, Abu, Abu and Abor that breeds with sows, and then we go home and there make sacred offering, offerings to immortal gods who hold wide heaven, all of them in order. Your death will come out of the sea, such a gentle person, when you are bowed down with a ripe of a ripe of old age, and your people prospering around you. In all these things, I'm telling you the truth. Now, let's focus on the term shovel use it for winnowing. In Greek, you can find here the word uh, adhere loikos. Adhere loikos. Huh? Or loikos adhere. Uh, in my point of view, this term is kind of a hermeneutical key to the whole passage. Why? Adher in Greek means shaf or aw. Shaf or aw is, as it were, the outer covering of corn separated by winnowing or threshing. And the loigos means destruction or even doom. So, adhere loigos is the tool for separating core and chaff, as you can see on this uh, old Egyptian picture. <coughs> I'm sorry. On the left, on the extreme left, you can see a very ancient method of threshing. Some balls pound the grain against threshing floor with their hoofs. In the middle, this man is throwing in the air the mixture of corn and chaffs. The more heavier corn is failing to the ground, meanwhile the lighter shafts are carried away by the wind. In such a way, the corn is separated from shafts. In the case, the wind is not blowing. You can see here a man with a terreoigos, with a winnowing fan, who, as it, as it were, is weaving, or swaving, substitute the missing wind. So, such devices is Athere Loigos, we know in fun, and you can see here some resemblance with or eh? maybe. So, Tiresias advises Odysseus how to return to his house at, at the same time reconcile the gods. He should go as far as people can mistake the or for shower use it for we know win or or we know win fun that is to exchange the two for adventures and wandering the two which uh, the undying coils can be obtained for a two that belongs to a peaceful trivial settled life and by which the grain is obtained so that the bread can be baked. Does that mean that undying glory is not the greatest value to Odysseus? 
why he why is he so eager to return home where he has to go to undergo endless peasant labor humiliating or old age and infamous death at the end the explanation or more precisely a sort of uh, hint can be found in Odysseus talk with Achilles where Achilles complains about his condition in Hades in the 11th book of Odyssey so that is following passage Achilles Achilles uh, says don't try to comfort me about my debt Gorius Odysseus I'd rather live working as a wage laborer for hire by some other man who had no end and not much in the way of livelihood than what it over all the wasted debt. However, in Iliad, when Achilles has a choice between a short life bringing immortal glory and the return that would provide him when an infamous but long life, Achilles chooses his Cleos instead his 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 fame, his glory, instead of Nostos, instead of return to home. Achilles descent to Hades and his way is one way. Odysseus, on the other hand, chooses return, chooses Nostos, arrives at the same threshold of Hades, but only to know how to return home. And I am Cleos can be obtained by the beautiful death on the battlefields of by heroic deeds during wandering through the mythical world as Odysseus depicts them to the Phaeacians. From the point of view of the Iliad, it seems that these are the places where the heroes are at home. Achilles can only be Achilles on the battlefield of Troy and Odysseus is similarly defined as a person by his cruise through Oceanus. However, the Odyssey gives a little bit differentiated picture in Book 11. From the point of view of inhabitants of Hades, as Achilles, it turned out that people do not belong to these words mentioned above. These are words where Aether, the demigods or monsters dwell, and one can easily become both immortal, as Odysseus during his visit in Calypso Island, as well as a pig during the visit of Kirk's Island, but certainly cannot remain human. So, what does Homer means to be human? The answer will emerge, though in negative form, from the analysis of the fates of the gods, from the fates uh, that gods attribute to a trio of prominent Hades inhabitants which Odysseus meet, meets in the catalogue of ancient heroes. Eh? That is this passage. Eh? Catalogue of six heroes from the past. So these are the, the, this trio uh, is the uh, forms the only deaths who are actually punished in Hades. They are, these are three cosmic sinners who have committed a crime against gods and as well as against world order. These are Sisyphus, Tantalus, Tantalus the great, 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 uh, great, um, grand grandfather of Agamemnon and the last one, Titius. So, Titius was punished for trying to rape the goddess Leto. Leto was the mother 
of the god Apollon and goddess Artemis. Therefore, uh, Titius had committed the crime against the gods and the world order by trying to enforce sexual intercourse with someone who was ontologically on higher level. In return for it, Titius lies bound to the ground, while two vouchers rip his liver in Hades. His unbridled sexual desire is punished by the painful tearing of the organ of the liver, which, according to the Greeks, was a center of sexual desires. His punishment is rape on the rivers, which is carried out by animals that are ontologically, ontologically on the lower level than humans. The Tantalus crime is not mentioned uh, explicitly in Odyssey, but it is widely known that he will be punished, he would be punished for a double breach of the hospitality with the gods. Tantalus was, was allowed to share a table of gods, but he was stealing nectar and ambrosia from the divine table. And later, he also killed his, his own son, Pelops, and offered Pelops meat to the god for eating. Therefore, his punishment reflects the view that the order of the world corresponds to certain dietary rules. There are foods that are intended only for gods, the only one not poisoned. Then other foods for the people and finally there are some foods they are completely taboo. Keeping this taboo is important mark differentiated humans and animals. By cheating the gods to taste forbidden food, the food from prepared from his from Tantaus son Pelops, Tantaus seriously disrupted or undermined the order of the world. The offended gods then punished Tantaus by suffering from hunger, from eternal suffering from hunger and thirst. He is standing on his knees in the water with beautiful fruit, hang, fruits hanging above his head. But when Tantaus stretches out his hand, both disappear. The last one, Sisyphus, must throw a heavy stone uphill. When reaching the top, the stone will always slip and throw back down. Sisyphus is doomed to eternal toil without end and relief. He was guilty of trying to outsmart the underworld deities and escape from Hades. That is another divine insult and a serious disturbance of the world order because the human's way to Hades is always one way part. By his, by uh, Sisyphus, up and down movements, he eternally mimics or rather parodies the unrealizable desire of all human to escape from underworld into the world of living and in such a way to escape the human fate. Titius, Tantaus and Sisyphus were guilty against cosmic order in three important fields of human existence. Food, Tantaus, sex, Titius and death, Sisyphus. In short, human must eat, making babies or procreate children and die. These areas are governed by natural laws but also by cultural norms that are anchored in a cosmic orb, whose guardians are gods. The purpose of the myths about trespassing world order is thus to demonstrate and define what is normal. The eternal punishment of three sinners 
thus helps people to know their limits, to understand and accept the uncrossable boundary between gods and men. The passage of Nekea is the first step, this passage, is the first step leading to the gradual disintegration of the originally morally indifferent and principally collective fate of the shadows in the Hades, as depicted in Iliad. However, if the afterlife is not morally indifferent, it means NATO gods are morally indifferent. For the first time in the European history and European tradition, we can find a moral stratification of the afterlife in 11th Book of Odyssey, and also interconnection of the Hades with the world of the living. The deaths in Hades pay for their crimes committed during their lives. And also, and finally, gradual transformation of deities into guarantor of the moral order of the world. In the Iliad, the gods uh, cannot play such a role, but in Odyssey, they are first signs that the gods are the guarantors of the moral order, the punishers of the trespassing of this order, and that is very important novelty. I think there is a fundamental, fundamental line connecting vision in the 11th book of Odyssey, Plato's Plutarch and Cicero eschatological myths, which ends, this line ends, at the Dante's Divine Comedy. There is also a common view of the nature of punishment in Underworld, which are essentially of two types. The first one is the antithesis, as it were, antithesis of guilt. For example, in uh, Dante's Inferno, in the eighth canto of Dante's Inferno, the proud uh, peasant, Filippo Argenti, by the way, he is called Argenti because he wanted his horse have have silver horseshoes. So, in the eighth canto of Inferno, Filippo Argenti drowns in mud. Titius and Tantaus are the representative of this type of punishment in, in Odyssey, eh? antithesis of guilt. The second type, and in my point of view more more, more cruel and raffinite type of punishment is called contrapasso by, by Dante. And in such case, the sin or crime is dealt, is dealt with according to principle of sin should be cured by the same. In such case, the real punishment consists in the, so to speak, ex extreme continuation of the crime of sin. The Homer's example is Sisyphus. However, this motive is present also in the Calypso's offer made to Odysseus. Calypso offer, offer, offers Odysseus eternal youth and eternal sexual pleasure with her. Calypso is eternally young goddess. It is hard to imagine more horror. Yeah? Ah, so, kind of contrapasso. However, Odysseus is quite different from Tantaus, from Sisyphus or Titius. In the poem, Odysseus chooses between, on the one hand, a world where can be found cultivated land, baked bread, wine, properly performed sacrifices and sexual life according to familiar use. On the other hand, there is the word of wilderness, cannibalism in Greek, aleophagia, uh, ecstasy through intoxication, and demonic, unregulated sexuality. So Odysseus chooses civilization. It means the state where he can have intercourse with his legitimate wife, with Penelope, sacrifice to the gods, drink wine, 
and eat bread. When Odysseus first enter, first enters the land of his native Ithaca, he, kiss, he kisses Zeidoron Arura. It means he kisses the land that gives grain. In Greek, Zea, it's a very important gesture. You know? It is gesture of, of accepting of civilization. And the civilization from Homer in Odyssey is connected with, with, with uh, uh, bread, with wine, with uh, properly performed sacrifice to God with, with uh, sexual life according to familiar use eh? that are these are the fundamental cornerstones of civilization eh? for, for the for the home and the Odysseus adventures shows the other side of, of civilization eh? the wilderness so uh, there are two passages in Odyssey where man is directly described as bread eaters. Uh, you can find uh, uh, these passages in the ninth and tenth book of Odyssey. Uh, and uh, the passage is following. I sent some of my comrades out to learn about the man who ate bread upon the earth. And there are no such people, bread eaters, in the mythical world. Despite of their physical form, bread eaters are neither Lastrigonians, Lastrigonians are cannibals, human eaters, nor Lotophagoi. They are lotus eaters. Eh? The last three people Odysseus meets after leaving Troy are the Kikones, Sikonis, who, who saw the grain and grow the wine. In the mythical world, there is no one who knows how to cultivate the land. Therefore, there is no knowledge of bread or wine. Uh, by the way, the wine grows on the Calypso island, on Ogigia, but nobody cultivates it there. It grows someone on its own. Eh? It's not cultivated uh, uh, branch of, of, of wine. Eh? So, uh, Odysseus will not die with the beautiful death. He will succumb to old age and slow dying. Does it mean that he will that he will lose all his class? Obviously not. Odyssey itself is a proof. But how it is possible that someone will sing out Odysseus class without Odysseus being a true hero according to standards of Iliad? Whenever Odysseus and Achilles are compared. Odysseus gains the upper hand. In the last book of Odyssey, which was composed, probably later, nevertheless Agamemnon calls them both lucky. Achilles, for his coils, achieved by his beautiful death on the battlefield. Odysseus, because of coils of his faithful wife Penelope. Penelope remains faithful to Odysseus for almost 20 years. So a woman can have her coils, in which even her husband is celebrated. Thus, it seems there is more than one way within to Homeric immortality, that is, to never be forgotten and to be remembered and honored in songs forever. One can eat or die with beautiful death, but also, on the other hand, beget proper descendants with his faithful wife, and the descendants will remember both parents. However, in 
that case long life is more appropriate than than short life which is necessary condition for beautiful death it is no coincidence that during the time of roman emperor hadrian the most fam- famous and absolutely infallible delphic oracle declared homer to be an odysseus grand son so dear colleagues our time is nearly up and uh, i'm very proud that we have finished the topic of of uh, of homeric spirituality and next week we will turn our attention to do virgil so have a nice week bye bye and see you see you next tuesday